Hi, this is Mitch Easter, and you're listening to Icon Fetch. Welcome to Icon Fetch, the web's premier music interview show. Now, here's your host, Tony Peters. Well, welcome to the show. Now, the Connells came out of the same southern pop scene that birthed R.E.M. and Let's Active in the early 1980s. They scored multiple hits on U.S. college radio with songs like Something to Say, Fun and Games, and Stone Cold Yesterday. Stone Cold Yesterday The band was even bigger overseas, turning in the surprise European smash 74-75 in 1993. The band's 30-plus year career finally gets distilled on Stone Cold Yesterday, the best of the Connells from Bicycle Music Company. And from the band, we welcome in singer Doug McMillan. Doug, how are you, man? Great, great. Thanks, Tony. Yeah, that's um, best of record, finally. <laughs> right, right. I mean, th- this is the first time you guys have had your career compiled on one disc like this. And, and I mean, but longtime fans will probably notice that there are some things missing here. But, I mean, from what I understand, there's, like, a reason for that, right? Yeah, you know, there's some stuff that couldn't be on here from our first record and our our most well our last record that we made because they weren't they didn't fall into the into the tvt you know our old record label is what this uh all this stuff is part it was initially part of was the tvt catalog and um and i you know i don't know how much you know about that story but uh when tvt uh got to a point where they could no longer forge ahead um, they had uh, gotten in, involved with the Prudential Investments and gotten some kind of, kind of like a line of credit, you know, like any other business would do. They, right. They needed cash. And uh, that didn't really pan out um, as far as paying it back. <laughs> so the collateral assets that were taken in lieu of the money that was owed was the, the catalog of TBT. Really? And that's, that's where – so there was a period of time – God, man, in the 2000s, that no one could get any of our of our records. They were just not available. Wow, nothing, nothing was available, not even online. So that was really, you know, as you can imagine, that was really frustrating. You know, I mean, for, for us especially, because we, you know, we'd have people come up to us at a show and say, "I can't get your records," and <laughs> to explain to them what I just told you that it's part of this, you know, collateral package. Anyways, thank God for Bicycle Music, man. They came along and brought that whole catalog from the TVT, you know, from all the stuff they had available at TVT, I think, um, and made it available online. And now we have the best of record. And hopefully, you know, the idea would be that they would you know, release everything eventually after that. Let me tear down into your heart. Let me take a seat and stay a while. Let me tear down into your heart. I've fallen again. Nice, so nice. It's been, a long, it's been a long time. You know, it's been, that was a good day when we found out <laughs> that they kind of came to the rescue. Right, absolutely. And, they're, and they seem to be one of the good guys in the music business. I mean, Bicycle and, and Concord and all that, they seem to be very artist-friendly labels. That Yeah, I, I'm not used to that. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 yeah. That's not usual, yeah. Right, yeah, I mean, anybody just Google Connells and TVT, and I think you could spend a, a whole, uh, you'd be up very late reading about all that kind of thing. So I don't, you know, I, I, ordinarily I wouldn't even bring it up, but I just, it's important, I think, to, to understand that right. uh, we, we were sitting there going, what is, what the heck, you know, what happened? You know, it's like, now we can't, you know, it's like, it just got worse. So, the, the, just, to, just to kind of give, you know, the kudos to, to Bicycle, man, I just couldn't be happier. They're just great. The crown is off the one headed you. You down and out the side step through. Then pound it out the crowded streets. Ten o'clock so, but uh, yeah, it's weird. It's weird. It's weird to to see. You know, when I was growing up, you know, the the greatest hits records were actually <laughs> Elton John's greatest hits. You know, right? <laughs> they were really hit songs. But but these guys, you know, the idea being that these are the songs that were released as singles to you know, either college radio or you know whenever they had modern rock or whatever they called it, alternative radio, commercial radio, and then I guess whatever stuff that they you know seventy four, seventy five, and uh, 
I think they, I think uh, Slackjaw was released. The Slackjaw was released as a uh, single as well in Europe. So right, right. Now that's the criteria. At least, right. Did you guys have any input into that, or did Bicycle basically say these are the songs we want? They, no, they de- they definitely let us. You know, they definitely said, "What do you think?" You know, and uh, there uh, there's some things got shifted around, and, and, and maybe something was um, there was a song here or there that. Uh, uh, was taken off and replaced with something else. I couldn't tell you what those were, but I, I, it's been a while. But um, right, yeah, no, that that was you know they they definitely wanted to know what we thought because yeah, I mean I, that you know it, that's a classic artist friendly thing to do. <laughs> right, sure, absolutely. <laughs> and know what's going on. So, right, yeah. right. Now, what's interesting is the sequencing as well is kind of you know yeah. I mean obviously you open with Stone Cold Yesterday. <laughs> And then it almost seems like you get sort of pockets of, you know, the 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 first few tracks are like your most recent three or four albums or whatever. And then yeah. it, it, it's kind of interesting. But you have Scotty's yeah. Lemon and over there, like sandwiched right next to each other. It's you, I swear. It's you, I swear. I delight in my despair. It's you, I swear. It's you, I swear. Now, was there any talk of, I mean, do you guys have stuff in the can, unreleased, and B-sides, and that kind of stuff? Was there any kind of talk about putting any bonus tracks on this kind of thing? We don't really have all that much in that regard. We have anything that we have, um, we have a bunch of live stuff that we've never really released. I mean, we have some, like, we, for instance, I think it was on... Um, I want to say the, the the new boy, the song "New Boy" was released, I guess, as a single, um, but with a couple of extra tracks, and one of them was like um, a live version of uh, "Living in the Past" by Jethro Tull. Right. Yeah. Cover that song. Right. But, you know, that's a good question as far as that goes, because we have a whole bunch of um, live um, shows recorded that we haven't even sort of dig, you know, dipped into yet. Some somebody. Um, um, has uh, you know over the years, you know, people trade tapes and stuff. And somebody, I have to find it online, but they really, they uh, put together like a mixtape of uh, all the a lot of the covers we've done over the years live. Huh. And then this stuff there, I, I was like, I forgot we did that. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Like I uh, had a friend, some friends in a band called ba- uh, Satellite Boyfriend um, from Chapel Hill, and um, we used to play with them a lot. And every time we play with them, I'd get up and sing Brandy. Nice, nice. Okay, this is one of my. I mean, I love that song. Right, you know, nice. We, right. So they apparently they got that. That's on there. You know, so, nice. I mean, the stuff's out there. It's just the quality's not so great. But I think that uh, you know we can do that. In the meantime, um, just in July, we went to Mitch Easter's uh, studio. He's got a. He's had a new studio for since God since I guess the millennium. And um, you know, we recorded with him in 1987. And you know, I, I, I for one have always been like, you know, of the mind. To, we, we need to record with Mitch again because he's just a great guy to to work with, and he's just, you know, he's just one of the best. And so we got some new songs that we're working on, and nice. That's that's something we're kind of focusing on. But yeah, I'd, I'd like to. I, I need to find. You know, the problem with this li- all this live stuff is nobody wants to listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a it's an arduous <laughs> task, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I mean, it, it probably starts to run together after a while. You're like, okay, yeah. yeah. So you guys worked with Mitch Easter, and yeah. I mean, he is such a. I mean, he just has a history of being such a great producer. He's got a great set of ears, and I think he's like a really oh. good nurturing producer too. I think is is what I've heard from yeah. a lot of people. Um, yeah. I mean, what what did you take away from the sessions that you did with Boylan Heights? Well, I mean, you know, first of all, I was just so excited to to meet him. You know, I had never met him until well, I guess I met him when we when we played a show in Winston Salem, so he could come see us play to see if he wanted to work with us. You know, and 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 he did. And um, I mean, I was sitting there uh, the first day we were there. I was sitting right next to him, asking him questions <laughs> about Big Star. You know, right? And he was telling me some great stories. And, and he's one of those guys that. Um, and when I think about him, you know his production style, as opposed to say, you know, uh, like a guy like Hugh Jones who did one simple word, those are like very, very different approaches. 
uh, Mitch is not is not going to is not going to be pulling kind of a taskmaster role. You know, if something needs to happen, he'll figure out a way to communicate that without you know being difficult. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I'm not saying that Hugh Jones is difficult. I'm just saying it's a different personality. Sure, and sure, he's the, yeah. And he's the funny guy. He's a very dry, he has a very dry sense of humor. Uh, Mitch does, and uh, and he is just a hoot. record one simple word we recorded that in wales wow okay uh, yeah. that was pretty cool it's a real famous studio called rockfield and it's near monmouth um and uh what a beautiful place man golly it's really pretty and um and then you know while we're recording in in, in one of the studios and across the way we had joe strummer producing the pogues nice <laughs> so, nice yeah. Wow! Nick Lowe, Nick Lowe came and we worked on worked for the band. I got to meet Nick Lowe. I met Joe Strummer. I mean, it was like nuts. Wow! You know, I mean, I met Nick. I met Joe Strummer at, at, after up, you know, singing all night till six a.m. And I like had a little courage in me and said, "I'm going to go over there and meet these guys." <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> they were up, and I was up. So yeah, it was great. I, he was could not have been a nicer guy. I, I, you know, you just, you know, no, no, no airs about him. He was just the coolest man. I don't know, Joe Strummer in the Pogues. That sounds like a never-ending party, and it's <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, and the poor guy, man, he had to kind of babysit, you know, right? I mean, I babysit, but you know what I mean. Oh yeah, I, I can imagine those guys would be kind of hard to work with or whatever. But uh... I over there, and you know, it was in the summer, so it was like you know, the way we were far, we're far enough north so that like it doesn't get that dark at night and, and so 6 a.m it's still 5 a.m 6 a.m it's still kind of light and um and uh, i could hear music coming but i could tell it wasn't li- i could tell it was you know something they were listening to like mixes on a jam box hmm. and, you know the night and, and it was uh shane mcgowan and spider and joe strummer and they were they were you know they couldn't have been nicer and then uh shane and spider had to leave they had this big like wrestler looking like a handler <laughs> like road manager guy right put him in the car and drove him to the airport so they could fly to italy to play a show with Sinead o'connor wow huh <laughs> that, that in itself kind of blew my mind right but so then when they left he said um you want to go look at everybody's room <laughs> <laughs> like and it was a great it, you know at, at first you think that's kind of on you know like you know what what do you you know you kind of nosy but Actually, it was really cool because you could kind of get a feel for each guy, you know. Right. And Shane's room was just fantastic. Right. That's awesome. <laughs> you can imagine. Right, right. But, uh, yeah. Let's talk about, so um, your fifth album, Ring, comes out, and you've got, you know, uh, Slack Jawed was a, a single on college radio. Carry My Picture got some airplay. Right. Um, but like when you're in the sessions for 74, 75, did this stand out like, Oh, this is, I mean, it, it from my knowledge, it wasn't even released as a single in America. So, yeah. I mean, here you are in the sessions. What did you think of 74, 75 when you were first putting it down to tape? You know, um, I always really liked the song You know, I was like singing it and, um, and I liked the way it was arranged. And I think my, my if I'm not mistaken, I thought to myself, this is like kind of like that song Pawns on Boylan Heights. You know, it was just really, kind of like a slower kind of a ballad. And that was it. I mean, none of us were thinking this is, I know Mike really liked it personally. Like, like he liked, you know, it was, some, it was sort of, you know, something that he was maybe a little more proprietary about. Is that right. That word? Yeah. Because, you know, it meant, more, it meant more to him maybe than maybe another song. But that was it. I mean, nobody saw that coming. And I remember one, a couple of times um, 
think it was in Boston one time, and the band that was opening for us, we were talking to the guys, and the man, their manager goes like, that's a monster, that's a smash. And I was like, what's he talking about? That song's not going to get on the radio. And, <laughs> and it did never get played here, but uh, what, what happened was um, um, this record company out of Stuttgart called Intercord Records, who had, before we came along, their big sell- seller was uh, Roger Whitaker. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Was, they used to call him the Whistler. I didn't. I learned all this at, when I went. To, we finally went to the record label to look around, and I was like, "What's all the Roger Whitaker?" And like, "Oh, the Whistler." He used to sing. He'd sing uh, his. You know, he had like "Old London Town" or "Old right. Some Old Durham Town." Right. By the way. yeah. And <laughs> anyways, he would he would sing a he would sing a verse in English, and then he'd do a he'd whistle a verse. Wow. Of, yeah, I, I guess just to get the melody across because he, he was he, he was I guess he was concerned about the language difference, which isn't really these days isn't that much of an issue. But so these guys came over I guess for something like CMJ or some kind of thing like that in New York and went straight to TVT and, and wanted to license that album Ring solely because they heard seventy four seventy five as being something that could possibly do something on the radio in Germany and maybe other countries outside of Germany and. The president of the label said, "That's you guys can do that. It's fine, um, but it's not going to do anything until it it goes over in, in in the UK." And they're like, "Okay, well, you know, that's fine. Thanks for telling us that." And subsequently, he he didn't try to lowball him or anything. You know, that's how much he didn't believe in it. <laughs> wow! So glad we took off took off in Germany. We started getting faxes from those guys in, in, in Intercord Records showing us the chart positions, you know, like, and it was just flying up the charts. And it was like, next thing you know, we're like, we're, you know, we were kind of, we thought we were done with that record because we, you know, it was the same, kind of the same thing had happened with the, all the ones before that was uh, we'd tour, you know, as much as, you know, we could and then go on to move on to the next thing, you know, because there was a kind of a glass ceiling hit, you know, we'd, we'd always hear from people, Either at the record label or at a radio station, you know, this is the one you guys, this is going to be, you're going to go to the next level. I hear that term a lot, the next level. Right, yeah. <laughs> we never went to the next level. <laughs> but then we started going over to Europe, and, and it, so we got to kind of, you know, while we were touring, we got to sort of watch it happen. And that was, that was weird. What, didn't it eventually, like, go number one in a couple of places, like Sweden yeah. or something like that? I mean, that's yeah. just, what? It was huge. It was, it was crazy. The guy was right. It was Monster, Smash, or whatever, but it wasn't in America. Yeah, it was like in the Netherlands, um, all over Scandinavia, like in, in you know, Norway, uh, um, uh, Belgium, um, Austria, Switzerland, Italy, um, France. Got no reason for coming to me in the rain, running down. There's no reason. I want to say that the, 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 the highest rate, uh, charting was maybe in the Netherlands, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong about that. But, yeah, it was number one in a couple of countries. It was even a big hit in, is, in Israel. And wow. we didn't go there. But, yeah, it was just weird. Yeah, EMI came along, and, and I guess they picked it up, and, uh, and, and it just really kind of took off after that. But, I mean, Intercore Records, those two, those two guys kind of decided this. Wow. That's, I mean, that's crazy. No, so as that's going on, did you guys then go back over and, I mean, did you actually end up touring some of these, like, say, the Netherlands and stuff like that while this was number one? Were you able to capitalize yeah. on that? Yeah, we did. I mean, uh, you know, the initial idea was that we'd go over there to tour to, to help things along. I don't know if we helped or not. Because <laughs> <laughs> we would go play, like, we, 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 would, we did so many different types of gigs. You know, we'd play in clubs, and then the next day we'd be in a festival somewhere, you know. And they w- and we'd play, our, you know, and like well, I guess the first one of the first things we did was play a festival in Germany called the Lorelei Festival, and like um, we would play a set, you know, a normal set, and nobody knew us, and they didn't know that song. And then as time went on, and we played more and more of those things, we'd play a set, and the people would recognize into the band, but they only re- really react to that one song, right? So kind of interesting. Now, did you did you have like a, a particularly large gig at one point where you played for like a, a, a 
an amazing amount of people over in Europe or anything? I did. <laughs> we, we most certainly did. And I was, I was trying to remember the, the number they gave us. And again, it was like, you know, before it was in Rome, it was, uh, there was a piazza where the, 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 um, the Pope does his, uh, lunchtime mass or something like that. Okay. And, um, I can't remember the name of the program. It's basically like a, 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 a an annual event where they have a few bands perform. Um, uh, like maybe a, we only played a couple of songs, and and uh, along with Def Leppard. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's... And I'm still kicking myself for not going in to meet those guys. I, right. I mean, I, I wish I had because I really I I think those guys have you know uh, and I have friends who are. Who are you know who hate the the more popular Def, Def Leppard stuff because it's not it's not as it's not really metal it's it's more vocally driven you know what yeah I'm but they're great po- I think they might they write great songs that's the I thing do too. I'm glad to hear yeah I'm, I, I, sometimes I have to you know state my case with, with, with right but I'm glad you agree yeah and, and I've heard of those guys who are big big glam you know like Bowie and T Rex fans which right makes sense. yeah anyways but I, I I just I dropped the ball there but. Yeah, uh, and uh, who else? Atlanta Miles, uh, Black Black Velvet. Black Velvet, right, right, right. That was weird. Like that, you know, like that was going on. So, anyways, uh, uh, um, so by the time we get out there and to play, um, we can see there's a lot of people there, but we didn't know there's like over a hundred thousand people. There. Oh my God! Wow, yeah, that's just a mind blower. And it, it's just one of those sort of it was kind of a free concert. Thing. So it's you know, it like kind of an estimate of the amount of people, there. right? But it's man, you know, and like. It's it's all televised. It's all kind of driven by 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 this this show that they're doing, and um, um, so when we walked out, they weren't quite ready for us to begin. So we had to like do you know we have an audience, <laughs> but they're they're worried about the TV. You know they're they're like you know you guys will be on in just a minute. So so like we're like what do we what do we do? And we can't just play anything because the guitar Mike uses for that song is isn't a different is a different tune. It's different. It's like tuned down or something. Oh like that. wow! Okay. Steve, I, Steve Potak and I used to, we still do this to figure out something to do. And he uh, we we used to do a song for John a song for called John's Burg, Illinois by uh, Tom Waits. We do like a verse and a chorus of that. <laughs> they didn't know the song, but it was just something to do. Just to uh, get killing time, right? Yeah, that's kind of awkward standing there on stage. Hello, uh, yeah. What do you want to do? Like tell jokes or something, right? <laughs> by that by that point, you know, it was getting to where people were sort. of, I mean, we're not. You know, they played the video a lot, and it's a really cool video. I mean, and you're not going to hear that from me very often about a, any video I've been <laughs> right, video right. I've been but um. It's, but we're not in it much, which is probably why it's good. But, uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> but, when, um, yeah, I mean, let's talk about that. The 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 video for seventy four seventy five um, that wasn't really your idea. Somebody else kind of got that idea. Is that right? Yeah, a guy named Mark Pellington. Um, Mark is an old friend of um, well, a friend of our, an old friend of our manager Ed Morgan's. He knew him from um, <clears throat> I guess from school from from high school and. Um, um, Mark is, is a, 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 an incredibly gifted, um, uh, filmmaker. I mean, he, he started off making videos. He did the Jeremy video for, for, for Pearl Jam. Oh, wow. Okay. So this, this guy had a track record already. Okay. All right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I was more than happy to let him do it because that, that one of the hardest things we had to do while we were touring, um, and, and doing interviews for that, for that song was, trying to explain what it was about because even mike was we're not really sure you know it's kind of a boy meets girl boy loses girl but you know it's it's, it's you know it's just a, the, the lyrics don't really you know it's more of a mood you know what i'm saying so right sure it, it was fine that he we were more than happy that he took this approach and it was just a matter of like you know going you know he, you know the idea being that you know, he's going to go to the the, 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 you know, uh, probably the best known high school in Raleigh, uh, Broughton High School, the oldest, the oldest high school in Raleigh, and um, and you know, if you haven't seen the video, for anybody who hasn't seen it, it just basically shows a yearbook photograph of the person from 1975, and then what they look like now, and you know, you can just tell by just by the way some people look and their appearance, it's that they've some stuff has happened. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It's some hard awful. living. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, so you talk about the fact that you guys are, uh, you have done some recording at Mitch, Mitch Easter's studio, um, you know, but that's kind of 
on the back burner kind of thing? You just got, I mean, it, where is the progress on that? I mean, anywhere close to a, a new record, or is it still kind of in the works? We have, um, I want to say, six basic tracks down. I okay. Think. All right. I mean, like, um, we, I didn't do any vocals. I just did scratch vocals. But, um, like, I guess the guitar parts are down and keyboards. I mean, most of the stuff that we need, no flourishes or anything. I don't think it's going to be a problem of, of uh, material. I think you just, you know, we're going to have to figure out that when we're going to do it. Right. Now, um, do you guys have, like, some upcoming shows specifically to promote the best of kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, these are the kind of shows we would probably be doing anyways, but uh, I think the one we're going to be doing next in the next couple of weeks here in Raleigh uh, on September 17th is um, a couple of years ago we did a show at this, at this beautiful place in Raleigh called the Raleigh Little Theater, um, which is uh, actually the theater itself is, is an indoor uh, uh, facility but um, or venue, but uh, the, they have a little amphitheater, you know, like an old like you know, stone, you know, kind of a, st- a stone um, scaped uh, uh, amphitheater that uh, we played at for our 30th anniversary, which is still hard to believe. Right. And so we're going to do that. Yeah, we're going to do that this uh, this coming September, September, middle of September, and um, and a lot of it has to do with this. Yeah. Nice. I well, I mean, I, I wonder, you know, do you have to lear- relearn any songs? Like, you know, if uh, you're trying to hit stuff on the best of kind of thing, is there any talk about? <laughs> You know, that's a good question. I'm looking at this thing, and it's like there's a couple of songs on here that I'm looking at that we've never played live. Wow. Well, those are those are more more, more recent, um, but uh, there's a couple that we haven't played in a very long time. Um, so I mean, we didn't, you know we'll have to rehearse anyways. <laughs> right. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of these. As it would, you know, as as you would imagine, or you know, because uh, they, 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 they're they're part of the best of. It turns out, <laughs> right? Ones we play in our set, right? You would, you would. These are the frequently rotated songs, kind of thing. Yeah. So, there's a reason for that. So, so um, now, do you guys, uh, what's your what's your website where people can uh, kind of find oh, up? It's uh, theconels dot com. Theconels dot com. All right, well, cool. Well, Doug, it was good talking to you. The uh, the new best of the Connells. Is uh, stone cold yesterday, and good luck on it. And uh, you know, hopefully, we get to see some uh, Connell's uh, reissues then in the near future too. All right, thanks, Doug. Thanks again. Take care. You got it. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. It's Doug of the Connells there, and it's great to finally have their music back in print after over ten years. And it's also great to have a lot of these good songs on one disc. It really kind of. Gives you a chance to reevaluate this band, and especially if you didn't really get a chance to get into them the first time around. So that does it for this edition of Icon Fetch. Until next time, I'm Tony Peters. Thanks for listening. We'll see you soon. You've been listening to Icon Fetch with Tony Peters. Want more great interviews? Head over to IconFetch.com. There, you'll find every interview we've ever done, plus CD reviews, This Day in Music, and a random album of the day. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. Who is Tony going to interview next? It could be you. Send what you've got to Tony Peters. Icon Fetch, P.O. Box 292134, Dayton, Ohio. 45429 or email Tony at host at iconfetch.com. Until next time, this is Joe Kelly. Have a great day.